Zoe Hewitt is my guest today. I'm excited about this because I know absolutely zero about this topic. So let's just start by Zoe, say hi and to introduce yourself. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for having me, Terry. Um, I'm an interior designer and I'm based in Bristol. I was a set designer before, but I've switched to interiors. It's the same skill set, just different application. So now I work with real clients and real properties and it's it's not make-believe and it has to last more than three weeks. <laughs> oh, that's a, yeah, that's a lot of work, isn't it? When you're doing a stage, I'm imagining you plow your heart and soul into making it perfect and then... And then it's gone. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they lasted more than a few weeks, but um, yeah, it's very transient, whereas now everything's a bit more, has a bit more permanence and a bit more longevity. So that's I nice. think that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. And I know like hundreds of people must get to appreciate it when you do it as a stage show, but I would imagine that there's something a lot nicer about doing something that personally impacts somebody. Yes, that is rewarding, actually. When you see it making a difference to somebody, that really that, that does definitely hit the reward button for me. <laughs> yeah. So primarily for people, indiv- people, not animals, people, individuals or <laughs> companies or? Mainly individuals. I did do a project once where my clients ha- had pets that they were particularly keen on. And there was some provision for pets r- running around this is a long time ago. I can't remember all of it now, but there, there was some sort of play structure for cats or something. <laughs> That's brilliant because I was actually joking. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. I've done quite a few weird, wonderful things. Um, but I've, I have done a few like small pubs and small restaurants and things. I'd like to do a bit more commercial, I think small scale. Bristol's full of so many independent businesses that are fantastic that I'd love to kind of get my hands on basically I'm really greedy and I just really <laughs> like all kinds of interior design <laughs> nice <laughs> yeah yeah but that's variety isn't it everybody needs variety in life yeah yeah so we are going to talk about how it affects our well-being and mm. how it how colors make a difference and that sort of thing uh, so let's start with why now, I know it's a really vague question but why does our interior, why does the environment around us, why do colours make a difference to how we feel? There's there's loads of research into this because I guess people have cottoned on that there's a there's a correlation to between our interiors and how we feel. I think it's a really human need to decorate, like even cavemen did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I have done a little bit of reading up on this ahead of today and I I came across uh, some stats around how clutter makes particularly women feel really stressed and it actually increases cortisol like quite significantly and that's definitely something I've experienced firsthand and my current place is not immaculate but (laughs) it's it feels good it doesn't feel Clutters, and I've had a bit of a clear out lately. I think that's probably the most noticeable one, where it really instantly affects your well-being. I think. Yeah, there's an old saying, isn't there? Tidy, tidy house, tidy mind. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I find that as well. Particularly, I c- I can't bear clutter. It drives me absolutely crazy. It doesn't seem to bother my husband so much. <laughs> well, I've I've read something somewhere where it literally has been researched and proven that it doesn't affect men quite as much as it affects women. <laughs> I don't know why that is. No, I don't know. I wonder if it's something to do with um, the typically maternal housekeeping brain that we've got. Perhaps we just spend more time in it at home being affected by it and yeah. trying to, st- you know, generally, I know it's a sweeping generalisation. There are lots of men that do all the things as well, but generally speaking, it does tend to fall to us, doesn't it, to keep on top of the tidiness and the smooth running of a household. (laughs) Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It's just one of those things. The female will do it. And and like you say, sweeping generalisation, obviously, doesn't apply to everybody, but (laughs) it does. We have endless conversations in our house. My family chat gets it. Every now and again, there'll be a message of, I am not your keeper and I am not your slave. (laughs) Because it just does, doesn't it? It just falls down to women most of the time to do these things. 
It's just really frustrating to try and do any tasks in a mess as well. And when you have to search for something and, and move 16 other things to get to the thing you actually need to touch to to use it to do whatever you're doing, I mean, that level of frustration is just <laughs> too much for me. So I try to not have that here. Yeah, same. I, I, if my desk is covered in stuff, then it's, it's it's not even distracting. It's just annoying. And then can't focus on what I'm doing, can't think about things clearly. So whether we realise it or not, it does have an impact, doesn't it, on the way we feel about our surroundings. and where we Yeah, are. absolutely. I'm, I'm sort of halfway through this book that I keep picking up and I need to actually finish it to call The Architecture of Happiness. It's absolutely fantastic. And there's a, there's a, a, a little story in there about uh, when the author goes to a church and has this like amazing experience because obviously the architecture is designed to make you feel awe inspired. And then he goes to a McDonald's across the way and he's just, you know, completely depressed. <laughs> oh, <it's> just... <laughs> so these places really do impact us and our responses to them. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Do you think things like McDonald's, places like McDonald's are designed to not make you want to stay in them? You go in, you get what you want, yes. and if you eat there, you eat there and you leave. Absolutely. So apparently orange is a really good colour for making people feel like they want to eat. So red and yellow are uh, appetite stimulants, which is why they use it in their in their branding. But they use orange sometimes in the restaurants because it, it's it, it's a colour that you can have enough of quite quickly. So you eat and you leave, and it helps keep the turnover of customers quite quite fast. So we're literally being manipulated by colour. <laughs> yes, and that coupled with the fact that if you go to McDonald's, there's no comfy seating, there's no cushions, you know, there's no comfortable armchairs like you would get in, say, a nice cafe for example um there's nothing comfortable yeah. about sitting in mcdonald's no or like an I'm ivy ready. brasserie where it's designed to be a, a, an experience that you stay for a long dinner and enjoy and for example just as a comparison yes that plushness it's lacking in mcdonald's for a reason yeah and i didn't realize red and yellow were appetite stimulants blue is an appetite suppressant and I think it's just because there's not a lot of blue food, maybe. I'm head to toe in blue today. <laughs> you are. I love blue. <laughs> I wear a lot of blue. Oh, yeah. Right. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, it's one of the world's most popular colours, apparently. Um, blue and that sort of turquoisey, tealy turquoisey colour. Blue is associated with like trust and sort of dignity and reserve. What else? loyalty you'll see it a lot in kind of corporate branding for, for like banks solicitors those kinds of organizations wear a lot of blue as well <laughs> i read somewhere that blue and gold particularly screams high end and corporate like you like you say so that mm -hmm. matches up oh let's dive in let's talk about colors then so let's okay. talk us through a range of different colors and what they mean and Go where you like with it. The happy colour is yellow, but it's it's quite a controversial colour as well because I, I talk about this in my workshops. I run interior design workshops and we do a little bit about colour theory and then a way to like break the rules. And we have a little quiz game where we take it in turns to read out a fact about colour. And okay. yellow always gets a bit of a hard time because apparently too much of it can make people feel nauseous. So it's apparently avoided in aircraft interior design, apart from maybe Ryanair. I was going to say, apart from Ryanair. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, but you don't see a lot of yellow in places like that. And it's apparently because it can make people feel sick if there's too much. Apparently it's associated with making people feel crazy. There's a novel, um, I haven't read it. It's about, what's it called? The yellow, was it the yellow wallpaper? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember. But the story is this, this woman who's kind of locked up in this bedroom and goes bonkers after a while because of this yellow wallpaper she's to keep looking at. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, we just may have all these different associations with things. And, of course, they're different here in the West to how they might be in the East as well. We don't yeah. all share the same sort of associations with colour universally. 
but yeah, pops of yellow are joy promoting. Okay. Yeah. So if anyone wants to pick me up, yellow plant pot or something like that. Doesn't have to be a whole wall. That might be a bit much. <laughs> yeah. That'd be too much. Depending on the intensity of the yellow as well. It's it's one of those things. Orange is quite a joyful colour too. And green is a very relaxing colour. And I whenever we go to the woods, there's some response in us that instantly helps us feel relaxed. But I think it's something to do with the wavelength of the colour as well, um, because it's all light. Red is a, a, the longest wavelength, so it sort of advances to us, which is why we use it for stoplights, because we see it more easily and more quickly than any of the other colours in the spectrum, whereas green is the most restful one for our eyes to settle on. So we can look at that for a long time. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about colours as light. I hadn't mm. thought about it actually transferring to you and the way that works with the brain. Now, for me, it starts to become clear why colours make a difference. If there's a difference in how they get to you, how they hit you, how you receive them, then that now makes sense to me why you would have a different reaction to them. I love colour, but I can have, even I can have too much of it, which is probably why this, this room that I'm in is, is white, which disappoints people sometimes because of what I do. So if we're thinking about designing our spaces for the right emotions, for example, how do you approach that? So let's start with, we think of the bedroom as relaxation, right? Yeah. So how do you approach that from a design perspective? Generally, for a bedroom, you, you don't want it to be too stimulating. So painting it all red might be just just too much. you know. And also, uh, apparently, we don't sleep well if a room is hot or if it feels hot it only wants to be about apparently it's between like 16 and 18 degrees okay. so if you're going to paint it like a strong red or a strong orange it's not going to turn the actual heating up but it's going to make you feel warmer and hotter and apparently that can also diminish your quality of sleep oh okay so but it doesn't mean you can't have colors in a bedroom but you maybe don't want lots of colors and lots of pattern and lots of stripes and lots of everything. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really important because sleep quality has a massive effect on the way that our day goes. Because if you have poor night's sleep or a very broken night's sleep, then the day is a struggle, isn't it? So yeah. to promote that restful sleep is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I'd also avoid sort of high contrast things in a bedroom. So like lots of black and white or or even like leaving the ceiling white and then painting the walls in something else. It, it can be quite a jarring effect but with the white being so bright and then something else being pale. So in my room, I've, I've used this lovely colour called Tuscany. Oh. <laughs> I, I love a paint name. And it sounds it's like it's going to be orange. It is kind of. It's a sort of salmon pink. I mean, it sounds gross. But give it a nice name like Tuscany, it's, it sounds a bit better. But it's quite pale, but I've taken it on all the walls and over onto the ceiling as well. And it just sort of envelops the whole room. And I think if I'd left it white, it would have just been a bit of a stark contrast. Whereas now it just feels like a nice whole space and it is very calm, which I needed. That's nice. I, don't, I would never think of, of applying the same colour wall to the ceiling. Yeah, I think ceilings get forgotten a lot. And the convention is to just do it white. But to us designers, it's like a, it's another surface <laughs> that we want to do it's something It's another blank to. canvas. <laughs> yeah. So apparently, I just learned this from Instagram the other day. If you use one colour across the whole room, apparently that's called colour drenching. I never knew. I thought it was just painting it all one colour, but it's drenching. <laughs> it's, it's got an actual name. It has. Yeah. Okay, so we're going no big colour clashes, no big drastic change from one colour to another. We're going nice, relaxing, neutrals, are we thinking, in the bedroom then with just maybe pops of colour? Could be, could be neutrals. But also you can use a strong colour if 
you let it dominate. So oh, there's a fab Instagram account, uh, Raspberry Flavoured Windows, where she's painted almost the whole house black, which is really extreme for um, for a lot of people, but it really suits their family needs. So uh, her son uh, has a sort of, uh, he can get, get overstimulated. So by painting everything one colour, it's actually created this really calm effect, even though that colour is black. And it looks fabulous. And it has this really calm quality to it. It's great. I mean, black's not for everybody, for mm-hmm. sure. But it could be navy blue. <laughs> Yeah, it feel when I'm thinking about that because I don't know that Instagram account. I'm going to look it up after. But when I think about that, it feels like it's going to be really harsh and very, very dark. And I'm going to go and have a look. Yeah, it might not be your cup of tea, but it's uh, the, the principle is the same. It could it could be a really nice dark green, a foresty green with neutrals on the bedding or something like that, and still yeah. feel pretty calm. Okay, so then let's think living space, uh, like your living room. What do we think there? If we were promoting a really vibrant, energized, let's have lots of active time with the kids in this space, it's going to be vibrant family space. What do we go for? There's a difference, isn't there, between a really alive living space and somewhere that wouldn't be my cup of tea now because my kids are older and grown and I want my living space to be cozy, relaxing, very chilled vibe. So I'm just thinking there's a couple of different ways you can go with it. Yes, uh, infinite ways. <laughs> I've done a lot of kind of family rooms uh, where there's a lot of multi-purpose, you know, lots of different activities all happening in one room, not necessarily at the same time. But And of course, everyone's taste is different and everyone's response to colour is a bit different. So I haven't ever really got a kind of one-size-fits-all sort of answer but I suppose if you want to create something that's like convivial, then things like getting the pictures up on the wall really helps. And then that's a really great opportunity to have a bit of colour without committing to a large expanse of colour. You can get the get the joy in in a sort of small proportion. <laughs> yeah. Is is there a way to start implementing these things? Because Let's face it, it's an expense, isn't it, to completely overhaul a room and oh, yeah. especially if you're changing colour schemes, to do it all because you've got the walls, you've got the window dressings, you've got the cushions and you've got the decor that goes, you know, the bits and pieces that goes with this. How do you suggest people do it if they want to pick their space up, if they want to make some changes to make themselves feel better? How do you suggest that they can do it in a in an easy bit by bit fashion? Oh, I love a bit by bit. I, I think that the, sometimes I feel like the best interiors sort of evolve rather than just suddenly get done, you know. And there's always something you can do without spending loads of money. If you've got time, that's, that's, it's always the trade off, I think. <laughs> yeah. We've got access to so many amazing, like craft tutorials on YouTube for making, making things, you know, home, home crafts, whatever. But I'd say for a really quick, fix plants like number one go to then you get your 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 green fix to rest Mm -hmm. your eyes but they they clean the air as well and there's a lot of toxins in homes plants pictures up even things like decorating a plant pot or, or, or changing the pots around actually that's another thing i like to do is sort of move things around from one room to another and pottering on shell you know the stuff you have on shelves kind of curating that and rejigging it rejigging it every now and again can make things mm. feel kind of new without having to spend loads of cash <laughs> that's a really good point because everything that's on my shelves when i think about my house now has been there since i put it there forever ago when we first decorated the room <laughs> i never think to change the things that are on the shelves that's such a good idea yeah, and it applies to pictures as well, because after a while, you sort of stop seeing them. I'm due to collaborate with a, a fantastic woman next year on a workshop who called Claudia, and she her expertise is in art, basically. So she advises people on how to buy the art that they love rather than the art they think they should buy, but also how to hang it. And one of her suggestions is always to 
jiggle it around and move it every now and again. But also, you mentioned window treatments, and I think that window treatments and like really good curtains are a huge investment, really. And that's not something anyone wants to be changing <laughs> unless they really need to. So I think having a sort of emotional attachment to the fabric in something like that will help it to have longevity. And then if you were to sort of pick out colours from from curtains for the rest of the room, then it gives you many more options for changing it sort of every, changing the rest of the room every, you know, whenever it gets really tired and you just need a little change. Yeah. Is that a good place to start then? If you don't really know what colour you want, you don't really, you know, want you want to freshen up, but you don't really know exactly what you're looking for. Are the curtains a good place to start then? So you can pick the the colours, the patterns, the fabrics that you like for the curtains and build out from there. Yes, I've definitely designed schemes in that way. Or it might be a wallpaper that comes first because it's sometimes easier to match the paints to a patterned fabric or wallpaper than the other way around. And actually paint is the sort of cheapest way really to to get a big transformation quickly. I had some clients who were sort of gifted to me by a, a mentor who who's retired and she worked on their house like 30 years ago. And then when it started getting tired 25 years later, started working on on it room by room again. And they kept their curtains in their two reception rooms from the first time that she'd worked on their property all those years ago, cleaned them, relined them. But the fabric was such high quality, they would have been criminal to, to get rid of it. And they just changed everything else in the room. And they transformed, even though the curtains hadn't changed. That's amazing. What a clever purchase, though. Yeah. They, like you say, they've gone for quality, which... It isn't cheap, is it, when you buy curtains? They're so expensive, but that's mm -hmm. just proof that years and years and years later, they're still standing the test of time and yeah. things are changing around so you. important to choose what you love. <laughs> but yeah, it's a massive yeah. investment. But um, you can always make these things yourself, but it's beastly. I hate making curtains, if I'm honest. Do you? <laughs> I did. I've made a few... <laughs> I've made a few in my time, but only for things like the kids' bedrooms. It's a fiddle, but it's worth it. And also the, the acoustic softening properties that they have as well is really good. I've just put some up recently that I made and don't want to do that again for a while. But my daughter is so loud. And I've lived here for two and a half years without curtains in the living room. And the difference it's made to the sound already is fab. It's probably going to help my energy bills a little bit as well. Yeah. All right. So what about eating spaces then? You've already, we've already mentioned McDonald's and the choice of colours there against, you know, a really nice restaurant. But when it's in your own home and, you know, obviously the listeners to this podcast are working on their relationship with food and their eating habits and that sort of thing. So how do we design an eating space or even a preparation space, the kitchen, for example, so that it promotes a better relationship with food or, you know, feeling more relaxed around producing food and eating food? Oh, that's a great question. I've read something somewhere where it said, you know, eat the cake, eat the biscuits, eat whatever, but have your fruit on show. I, I remember as a kid in the 80s, my mum saying that, having a bowl full of fruit was like the height of luxury because it would have been quite pricey to build a bowl full of like exotic fruits and have a pineapple in it would have been wild. <laughs> I go through phases with my fruit basket. So sometimes it's a big glass bowl and then other times it's baskets hanging. It's a two-tier thing. Sometimes it lives on the work surface and sometimes it lives on the table and it's interesting how just bits and pieces like that make a difference. Yeah. I suppose having a think about the way produce is displayed, maybe even abroad. I mean, like strings of onions, so beautiful. My mum used to have hops in the kitchen. I mean, most people would be like, ugh, dust and grease trap look great though. But yeah. <laughs> I suppose anything that makes you feel like, oh, that looks delicious, you know. I would love a really nice, I mean, my house does not lend to this, but I would love a really nice big kind of typical country kitchen where you've got things like 
the racks with the hops on and 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 things hanging and just just lovely just lovely nice. Com- it screams comfort to me that i think that's what i'm after in a space where i'm going to prepare and eat food because for a lot of people that are overcoming disordered eating food can be very stressful food prep can be very stressful very overwhelming so to make it a comfortable homely space mm. is really important it wants to be user friendly and easy doesn't it yeah, I love seeing food stuff in like glass jars with a, a chalk pen label. I love. It. In fact, I'm I'm in the process of ordering my herbs and spices like that because I love the aesthetic of it. It feels nice to use, and a, a pint of milk in a glass bottle. Love that. The tactile joy of like a pint, a proper pint of milk that isn't in a plastic bottle. Yeah, I love stuff like that. And I suppose, like, I, and maybe it's because I'm a designer, I'm a bit obsessed with product design of anything, but, you know, a nice knife and a nice chopping board, just putting the joy in everything, a sort of sensory, sensory pleasure, good lighting as well. Oh, what do you mean by good lighting? So good task lighting, usually under the wall cabinets, so you can see what you're doing really well. I've I've had no light in my kitchen for a year because I had a leak from the roof and on the top floor of the flat. But I've now reinstated the light just this week. So that's definitely one to celebrate. Um, so I've been cooking in the dark for a year. Don't do that. No. <laughs> oh, God. It's hard <laughs> enough already without doing that. <laughs> um, I love my little kitchen. I've got the, there were a red, red tile splashback that came with the flat from the previous residence. So I've, I've painted it a nice colour to go with. It's going to sound a bit gross, but it's a sort of dark, rich Caribbean kind of zingy green. And I've taken that over the ceiling because there's not a lot of wall space. So it's, it's looking great. Now, but, isn't there something that says red and green should not be seen? Oh, yeah. I've heard that about blue and green as well. But all these all these things are just complete lies. Because like, you'd never look at a field with the blue sky above it and think... Oh, what an awful colour combination. <laughs> or, or like red baubles on a Christmas tree. Oh, how ugly. Yes. <laughs> but people just make this stuff up. <laughs> yes, that is a really good point. How do you suggest people learn how to put colours together? Is there a way to do that? Is there, is there a resource where people can see what kind of colours go really well together and what, what will clash and look absolutely awful should you choose it yeah that, there are all kinds of rules for how to put colors together there's a, a color wheel and all the color wheels look slightly different but i never actually learned how to use a color wheel until i started teaching workshops and i thought it's not helpful if i just say oh i we'll just pick everything just instinctively put colors together that's of no use to anyone so i learned how to use the color wheel <laughs> But what I usually end up saying to people is actually just look to nature and you could even get your camera out and photograph a beautiful flower or a beautiful bird or a landscape because the the colour combinations that you'll see in nature are never, they're never unpleasant. I'm I'm yet to find like an ugly natural colour combo. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's such a good idea because I am... I am not a creative person. I don't have this natural creative ability to just, to just do the figuring out what feels right together. I would love to have that. You are, you obviously have this really nice natural ability to just feel when things look really nice together. So to have something like go and look in nature is that works in my head. The other advice would be to have a look at a color on a paint chart, any colour, and just consider how you, your body feels in, res- in response to it because that will, I think that will always tell you as well what, what you really think about it. Why do colours never look the same on a paint chart as they do on your wall? Oh. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, I think it's to do with the, the light because light changes constantly. And sometimes if you use a different finish, so um, an eggshell finish or a satin 
you know, slightly, slightly shiny or gloss, high gloss finish. It's going to look different from the matte version on the paint chart as well. And then also when you've got another color next to the color you're looking at on a paint chart, it makes it behave kind of differently to how it behaves if you're just looking at it in isolation. It's very strange. And that's why we need to do tester pots. (laughs) Yeah. At the time, they feel like a bit of an expense. I mean, I know I'm talking a lot about expense in this one, aren't I? I don't mean that it should be everybody's consideration money, but you do look at a tester pot and think, oh, it's going to be nearly a fiver for one tester pot. Yeah. And, but actually, there's real value in getting a couple of those and sticking it on your wall and seeing what it looks like. I actually like to do it on wallpaper, um, lining paper, a really big swatch and two coats of it. Usually when people use tester pots, they put a little tiny patch and then they'll put another tiny patch of a different colour next to it. But it'll only be one coat, so it looks scratchy and not it's not the best representation of that colour. <laughs> yeah. And then they behave weirdly next to each other. So I always suggest big, as big a piece of paper as you can cover with one tester pot on a bit of lining paper and then move it around the room, look at it different times of the day and see how you feel about it. Oh, that's a good idea. Get the most out of that fiver. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, I don't want everything to be about money. But the reality is for a lot of people, it is about money. And, and yeah, yeah. it's a shame. It's something that really bothers me about my industry because there's no getting around it. It costs some money. But thanks to technology like eBay, Gumtree, you know, we can find amazing bargains, furniture, cheap stuff, free stuff, do it up. But of course, then it means you have to invest the time, but there's something anyone can do. And it doesn't all have to be about luxury, gold leaf and marble. And, you know, I feel like all all levels of interior decor are valid and important because it affects everybody. Yeah. I love upcycling. I love no, I'll tell you what I love. I love buying things and then having my husband upcycle. <laughs> <laughs> but some of my bedroom furniture, for example, is really, really nice, big, chunky, solid bits of wood. And and it looked awful when it got to us, but there's potential in it. So once it was stripped and treated and repainted and whatever, it looks great. So I'm all about free cycle and upcycling furniture i think it's it's brilliant and like you say it doesn't doesn't get wasted then it doesn't go to landfill it's it yeah it's great it's a really good way to do it yeah i agree yeah um you mentioned earlier toxins yeah i want to touch on that and the toxins in our home because obviously they well you explain you explain and then (laughs) i'll just shut up (laughs) oh (laughs) Well, unfortunately, our our homes are full of toxins. Carpets aren't particularly good for us. And sofas and armchairs, basically upholstered furniture, is not good for us either. About 18 months ago, I met this fantastic upholsterer called Delith Featherston Dilker. I always find that a bit of a mouthful. She's brilliant. And unfortunately, she noticed she was feeling ill and she made the connection between occupational health as an upholsterer and her not feeling very well did some digging around because it turns out she used to be a lawyer and so she knew how to research things and sort of join the dots and she's basically discovered that the flame retardant chemicals that are used in on foams upholstery foams and the top fabrics are so toxic and it's it's disproportionately affecting upholsterers, obviously, because they're super exposed to it when they're ripping apart old chairs and things. Children are disproportionately affected because they spend most of their time on the floor and the dust. Uh, basically, these every time we jump around on a sofa, it kind of off-gasses this stuff. The particles go down in the dust onto the floor. And, of course, children have a lot of like hand-to-mouth behaviours. Ah, it's awful. And... It it should be, and it's probably about to become a, a massive public health scandal, really. And also from a consumer uh, consumer rights point of view, this is a problem as well, because we're all allowed to buy these sofas. In fact, we can't buy any other kind of sofa because of the weird laws. But when that sofa has come to the end of its life, 
it's now considered so toxic that if you take it to the tip, it won't go in landfill. It'll be incinerated and it requires like special handling because it's so hazardous, but it's still okay for us to buy that and use it in our homes. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely horrendous. But it's thanks to Delith that word is just starting to get out and she's been featured in the press just recently. It's just like a, quite a long, slow campaign. But on the continent, uh, they they use a lot less of these flame retardant chemicals and their fire death rates aren't any different from ours particularly. So it's suggesting that actually the flame retardants that we're using aren't preventing fires because armchairs don't like spontaneously combust. <laughs> Um, and it's really complicated and it's kind of to do with the way that we test and pass a, an item of furniture. So we use an open flame test where basically someone sticks a Bunsen burner on the back in the middle of a chair. And if it catches fire in 20 seconds or under, then it's no good. It needs more chemicals to inhibit the flammability. Um, but abroad and in America, uh, America and Europe, they use a smolder test. So, for example, imagine someone's fallen asleep in the armchair, they're smoking, cigarettes on the arm. After 45 minutes, it might catch fire or it might just go out, depending on what the materials of the furniture are made of. But they use that kind of test instead of just sticking a bunts and burner on it because it is a much more realistic scenario for how a fire could start. Oh, it's so complicated. But basically, we need to stop using foam uh, or we need to stop using these FRs right now. But we can't. We can't just start reupholstering everything in a traditional way using sheep wool and horse hair, which is all inherently flame retardant, because we can only do that on furniture where the frame predates 1950. It's bonkers. So don't worry, we have campaign going to sort this out. Uh it's amazing. It's it's quite scary that actually because you think all these things are putting in place. You think of it as um, development, I guess. So over time, furniture has more rigorous testing, but actually the results of that now mean that there are more chemicals in the furniture. Um, the testing is not really appropriate by the sounds of it. That sort of, you know, not realistic rather rather than not appropriate. So to so somebody who doesn't know about it, it seems like things are good because they're progressing and they're making it safer. But actually, it's becoming more harmful. Um, how do we get around that? Like you say, we, we can't all find furniture that predates the 50s. Um, no, especially not sofas. That, no, no. And like you say, everybody's going to have one. So yeah. how do we deal with this what can we do what how can we make our living spaces a bit more friendly in that respect because these toxins are obviously going to play into our health yeah. play into our physical health play into our mental health um, and if we could improve that then that in turn might improve how we feel about ourselves so yeah yeah 100 percent. so there are a few things we can do um luckily del is del is kindly put some tips together for us. So she recommends regular vacuuming of furniture. Right. And obviously the floor as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, hoovering, hoovering your furniture with a HEPA filter regularly. And she also recommends loose covers. So made out of a, a natural fiber, like a, a linen or cotton or a mix, because that can sort of inhibit the clouds of horrible stuff coming off sofas every time we bounce around on them. If anyone listening was to go on an upholstery course, they could do whatever they wanted to their sofa. Because if it's for your own use, fine. But obviously I can't, as a designer, I can't specify to somebody uh, a fantastically healthy sofa because it would be against the law. It's bonkers. But if someone was prepared to DIY it, they could take all the horrible foam out, put some sheep wool in, fine. Yeah. 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 Or if they've got a vintage antique family heirloom armchair from Granny, that could be upholstered traditionally. And if it's pre nine fifty, no no trouble. Nice and nice and natural. 
that that's an expensive solution and DIYing it isn't an easy solution. So hoovering and loose covers for now. Yeah. And plants. Plants and regular airing. <laughs> oh, plants. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, they're obviously natural air cleaners, aren't they? Fragrance is a really good way to boost mood at home. And candles are also fabulous because the, the glowing light just, I suppose it's like a fire. It really appeals to us. A friendly fire, you know, really appeals to our human uh, instincts and the, the soft glow of the light. Um, but I, I would say beware of fragrance candles unless they're pure essential oils, because I have a sneaking suspicion that some candles may, if they have essential oils and that it's not purely natural candle, it may have additives in, which I suspect could be the same group of chemicals that are the flame retardants in furniture. But I haven't verified this yet. I need to do some more research. But apparently they're used, these additives are used to inhibit the flammability of the essential oils in candles. So it's, it has to be the same stuff or similar. So I'd say go for a, a beeswax or a soy wax candle, ideally fragrance free, and maybe get the fragrance from essential oils in a burner instead. And then you can play around with the different combinations of different yeah. scents as well. Because they're all, like colours, they're all associated with different kind of meanings as well. Like lavender is really good for sleep. So that's a good one for the bedroom. <laughs> yeah, I think there's uh, there's a lot of information out there, isn't there, on the different essential oils and the way you can use them and the impact that they have on you. Yeah. Yeah. I do think about layouts of rooms a lot. So the sort of practical function. I always start with that actually before I go anywhere near the colours and the fun stuff. It's always about the bones and the the function of a space first. We tend to arrange our living rooms around the TV, but actually, because we're all a bit disconnected and craving connection, if it's possible to arrange a space to promote conversation and socialising instead, then brilliant. That really helps. And also creating things like book nooks. No reading nook. That's that's a nice one. Sort of somewhere cosy to go and be. We need different things at different times of day, don't we? Or you know, different days of our lives. Maybe one day you do need the comfort of something like a book nook, and then other days I need something a bit more energising and and productive feeling. Um, what advice do you have for people with teeny tiny little spaces? I, I sometimes quite relish the challenge of a, of a tiny space. I suppose the key is to just not have too much stuff because there are all sorts of clever contraptions for, you know, beds folding down or desks folding down. And, but a lot of like using that stuff is quite a lot of admin that can just be really annoying if you've constantly got to move things and tidy things away. And I know it's not always avoidable, but I guess just not having too much stuff, as much stuff as your place can reasonably take but also sometimes bigger spaces are, are pro they're problematic in a different way like acoustics are a problem in a big open plan space a lot of the time uh, increasingly actually i'm having clients say they get like sensory overload or someone in their family does so thinking about acoustics is something i'm doing more and more right um, mm. yeah that was a tangent sorry no, no, not at all. I don't apologise. I love it. I love it. Oh, Zoe, thank you. It's been so interesting. Tell people where they can find you because you know, I always encourage everybody to come and follow and see what you're talking about and oh, cool. look you up and, and hire you. If, if <laughs> well, I I don't go by my name, Zoe. I've I've got a little business name now. So my little brand name is Stylemongers of Bristol. Because interior design is historically a bit stuffy. I wanted it to be a little bit fun. Um, so, yeah, stylemongersofbristol.co.uk. And I've got some free resources and, and ins inspirational pictures and things on there. So hopefully people might enjoy those. Uh, very colourful as well. <laughs> nice. Lovely. I'll obviously put the link in the show notes and um, people can go through. Uh, social media, you're on all of the socials or just select ones? or uh, Instagram, Pinterest. Facebook, less often, but yes, I'm, I'm on it, mainly Instagram, Stylemongers of Bristol again. Yeah, fab. Well, thank you, Zoe. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me come and talk about my favourite things. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. 
Uh, this is how I like to spend my days talking to people who, who can just spread a little joy. <laughs> That's what I like to do. <laughs> Excellent.